This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions about software engineering topics at least once a month. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for supporting the podcast. Welcome to another episode of Software Engineering Radio. This episode is, um, well, you could say a continuation of a topic we already had. It was actually in episode 62 when our guest was already uh, on SE Radio. And, uh, well, the guest is Martin Odersky. Hi, Martin. Hi, hi Markus. Uh, pleased to meet you again. Yeah, absolutely. And the topic is, not surprisingly, Scala. And uh, what we want to do in this episode is take a look at the somewhat more recent developments and also um, try to understand what this big research grant is all about that went through Twitter and blogs recently, where uh, some people were actually wondering how it's possible to, to work in Switzerland and get money from the EU. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, since, uh, I don't know, three or four years uh, the EU and Switzerland have signed uh, bilateral agreements. I think they signed them before, but it takes a long time until they actually go in, into effect. Mm -hmm. One part of the agreement is that essentially the research would be combined. That means ah. that Switzerland pays into the budget of this uh, the, the whole research grant and get, receives money for the grants uh, in return. Ah, okay. And I must say, it does a very, very well at that. Uh, I just looked at the total number of grants received per university. So EPFL Lausanne is number two in Europe after, after Cambridge. Oh. And I think uh, ETH Zurich is number four. So they might get more than their shares of money that they pay, but that's good for them. Well, that would explain the deal. <laughs> so, okay. Um, good. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about... Um, uh, actually, I don't exactly know at which uh, version number Scala was when we did the last episode. I assume that uh, some of the 2.7 and 2.8 language features we haven't talked about back then. So do you want to give us a quick recap? What has changed? What's new in 2.7 and 2.8? Um, two seven is a long time ago. I think in two seven we changed some, we added maybe some small things. Two eight was a big step release. <clears throat> uh, the main, uh, but it was mostly uh, a cleanup, uh, paying back technical debt kind of release. Mm -hmm. So over the uh, two series of releases, we saw that there were some things that didn't work out quite as well as we had hoped. Uh, one was the integration of arrays of, uh, into, into, into Scala because Java arrays are very, very restricted and we wanted to make them into full-blown collections like any other collection type. And the first time we did that in the 2.7 series, it sort of worked, but there were some, some parts where we, we, we what, what we found uh, not really ideal. So we, so we set out to redesign the whole collection framework, not just arrays, but a lot of other things as well, and put that in place. And that was, I think, the big step forward in 2.8, that now we have a, a functional persistent collections framework uh, that is uh, very... Uh, uniform in the sense that it works on all different collection types and you always stay in your type. Mm -hmm. I, I have uh, done a lot of research and I think Smalltalk had a collection framework also very beautiful uh, that's close to that, but then that's a dynamically typed language. Mm -hmm. In a statically typed language, I haven't seen that yet. And uh, I realize now that because it's actually very, very hard to achieve. <laughs> okay. That's, um, that's a big step forward that we did in 2.8. Is the... the is the fact that it's so complicated, is that, you know, is, is that inherent in building such a framework or is it because of you had to integrate it somehow with Java's arrays and collections and all that kind of weird combination stuff? Uh, I, there were two different set of problems. So the, at first, the first problem is, yes, it's inherently very, very hard mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the uh, it's just a new dimension collections that return collections and that always have to return the same collection you started with that you achieve all that without actually duplicating the code in every collection because that would be unacceptable you would end up with far too much code and you would have far too many opportunities for inconsistencies that way uh, so that's something new uh, if you look at let's say plain java collections then they don't do that so you create a reaction uh, collection you read from a collection an element you can update it you can delete it so that's just plain old crud collections mm -hmm. so this never enters the fact that you say well i want to 
transform the whole collection, map a function over it, filter it with a predicate, and I want to get back a, a collection of the same type. So if I do that on a set, I want to get back a set. If I do it on a list, I want to get back a list. If I do it on an array, I want to get back an array. So Smalltalk did it uh, very beautifully uh, at the time. And since then, I think very, very few uh, uh, collection libraries did it, certainly not C++, certainly not Java. And uh, the reason, I believe, is that to do that in a statically typed setting is just very hard. So it's a type system problem, right? It's a static type system problem, okay. that to, to be able to express that in a way that avoids code duplication. Mm -hmm. Then there was the other bundle of problems to say, well, how do we cleanly integrate sort of the, the old, good old Java types like arrays and strings and things like that into that framework? And there we sort of... Uh, <clears throat> Um, used something we already had in, in Scala. We just didn't use it consequently enough before. So now essentially all the previous compiler magic is done, is gone, sorry, and we do this only with, uh, with implicit conversions, which is something that we had in, in Scala. Uh -huh. um, so it's in a sense much more, it's less magic and more, uh, more systematic and more, uh, more regular the way we do that now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very happy with that overall. Mm -hmm. Anything else uh, worth mentioning in 2.8? Uh, there were, uh, I think there was a, one, one useful change is that we now have named, uh, named parameters and default parameters. Mm. Um, and uh, there were a couple of other small changes. Uh, we have uh, package objects, uh, type inference has gotten better. Uh, uh, that's, what, that's about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's planned for 2.9 and 3.0? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 2.9 is uh, is close to being released, so I can talk about that uh, mm -hmm. with confidence. So uh, the, the biggest change in 2.9 is uh, parallel collections. So we take the collections framework and we make uh, to give you optionally the, the possibility to uh, interpret all operations in parallel. So that said, where previously, let's say you had a map operation that applied a function to each el collection element one by one. Now the map can be applied in parallel, or more precisely, the collection framework has a very, um, a very uh, intricate uh, load balancing and uh, and clustering framework where uh, it will try to essentially have big chunks of things that can be executed then in parallel. Because if you have, a, let's say, a list of ten thousand elements and you want to con construct 10,000 tasks to execute each element in parallel, that's probably not the smartest idea because you, any gain you get in parallelism probably will be eaten up 10 times by the overhead of creating so many tasks. Right, right. so how, how does the framework find out, let's say, how many cores or processors or whatever are available in the underlying execution framework or execution runtime system to do this efficiently? Uh, it, uh, it works with fork join thread pools. Uh, so with Dagley's fork join framework, and I, I don't know the details, but I think there's a way to find out how many how many processes you are. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, it's the other framework's problem to find that out. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and 3.0, it probably sounds like, or, or will there be 2.9.1, 2, 3, 4, 5 years? <laughs> Do you have any plans for 3.0? Uh, no, not really. So uh, so I, I expect to get more... Uh, Libraries and and more. Uh, I think the focus will be will continue to be in parallelism. Uh, otherwise, for two point ten, it's still not that uh, not that clear. Okay, so they actually call it two point ten. No, even even that is not clear whether it's two point ten and three point oh. That will be depend a little bit on how far the, how big the delta is from two point nine. And uh, since a lot of that is essentially exploratory, and there's certainly a number of things we'd like to try, but none of the things I want to commit to yet. Okay. So, um, what do you think about the, you know, the adoption, the the ja uh, Java, the Scala community? How do you are, are you happy with how it developed or develops? Yes, I'm. I'm extremely happy how it develops because it seems that we we get uh, a big increase in adoption and. Uh, the increase comes from programmers that are curious, that are smart, that uh, communicate well. So it's a very, very friendly community. Uh, so my biggest fear was that as we grow, that the 
the let's say the, the the standards of the community would be diluted, which often happens, right? You get mm -hmm. a big community, then your standard of discourse go down. But uh, that hasn't happened, so I'm I'm really happy that uh, we just have more smart people in the community, and that's that's a great great fun to interact with these people, and I'm I'm really really proud to have that community. Any any recent big name projects? Everybody knows about Twitter, I guess. Um, who, who use Scala? Any success stories? Uh, we have uh, quite a few. Uh, so essentially, there are quite a few <coughs> um, consumer internet companies. So, well, Twitter, of course. There's Foursquare, which is 100% uh, Lyft Scala. There's mm -hmm. LinkedIn, which has uh, a couple of big projects now in Scala: LinkedIn Signal, LinkedIn Norbert, and uh, the usage is increasing in these companies. Uh, the other big uh, big vector is banks, where essentially all the big banks now have one one Scala project or several Scala projects, uh, so trading companies, banks, uh, uh, UBS, Credit Suisse, Bank of America, and so on and so on. Even I heard even the New York Stock Exchange has actually Scala in production. Okay. So so that's another big big area where where adoption is quite rapid. A any idea why it's Specifically, the banks. I mean, is there any? Is it just they're you know willing to experiment and adopt new stuff, or is there any specific reason? Well, uh, I think in 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 a lot of industries, you always have this trade-off of not wanting to be the first, of wanting to be conservative, using proving technologies, and needing to be better than the competition. So, uh, typically, the areas where uh, the uh, the the um, constraint or the, the necessity to be better than, than the competition have rap more rapid innovation. Mm. So internet startups is one of these areas and the, at least the investment part of banks is the other because you have to differentiate yourself. You have to be smarter, you have to be faster than competition, you have to have a better trading platform, right. all these things. I'm not talking about the back office, just sure. churning out uh, customer data and things like that. There, it's, it's probably much slower, although uh, I can't talk about that yet. Uh, we also have a, a, a big client that is in that field, so really boring payroll stuff. <laughs> That actually uh, is is, uh, is is just starting a Scala project, in that. but that's still confidential. So, uh, if you say client, that's probably uh, in connection with your Scala solutions startup company thing. That, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't talked about that yet. Do you want to say two, three words or sentences about it? Yeah. So that's uh, uh, also very exciting. So we are uh, uh, working on. Um, a much more uh, stable and professional set of developer tools. Uh, oh. We are uh, expanding our training. Uh, so we have uh, a, a, lo a large number of training sessions currently all over Europe. Uh, some in the US will, will follow. And uh, we uh, uh, work on new middleware components. Uh, so that's not yet uh, for public consumption, but there will be some big announcements to come uh, this year and next year. Mm -hmm. You mentioned developer tools. Actually, before our interview, I, I, I quickly twittered that we were going to talk and ask people whether they had any specific questions. And there are two questions came in. One is from Zef Hemmel. Um, When will the IDE support improve? <laughs> I think this is, I agree with him, that's a kind of sore topic for for Scala because, you know, it's a statically typed language. IDEs could do a lot of magic, but then the existing IDEs aren't really great. Mm. Yeah, in fact, uh, what we did for the company, we called 20 of uh, the the uh, companies that had Scala projects and we're asking them essentially the same question. What what do you need? Uh, what what kind of things uh, are the most important ones in the Scala space? And IDE support and more specifically good Eclipse support. Yes, was exactly. Yeah. Far number one. I think actually the IntelliJ IDE is, is steadily improving and is quite solid now. So yep. I think that that's not so much the issue. Uh, Eclipse is also improving, uh, but uh, currently lags behind. Uh, that said, I spent most of my weekend working on that, and uh, and uh, the, the company, the Scala Solutions, has uh, now. Uh, I think we have four people working on that, cool. so you should see some some significant improvements very soon. So. That, that's great. I, I recently tried to build an integration between Scala and EMF, so I can do a bunch of my modeling stuff with Scala instead of uh, Java. And uh, I have to say, I, I really have to force myself to use the Eclipse Scala ID. And, and, and IntelliJ doesn't help me in that case because I need it to be Eclipse-based. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's, that's right. I mean, Eclipse is still 
the most the most widely used IDE. So that's the most important one that you have a good a good offering there. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, another thing that came to my mind just a couple of minutes ago: um, How about the .NET support? Is that still really something you follow up on, or is it kind of deprecated? No, no, we certainly follow up. We have a project um, that, that that is continuing. It's uh, it's uh, not so easy. Uh, so there's there are lots of things to put in place to do. Uh, Scala is uh, now by now already a fairly big uh, language and libraries. All of that has to be ported to .NET. .NET is uh, not uh, is sufficiently different from the JVM so that you have lots of small small problems and you have to overcome them all. But that's certainly ongoing. So I I don't want to give you an estimated time of arrival, but uh, it should be certainly this year including oh. studio support that's great because um i think I, it might have been michael stahl who recently twittered when he was playing with f sharp and scala that he would really love to see um either or both of these languages to actually be both platforms so i see yeah yeah no though no, certainly that that would be useful um a last question about the current state of Scala that's uh, a question that came in from Achim Demelt and that is um what would you have done differently if you or would, would what would you do differently if you did if you restarted Scala now what would i do differently i um well if i restarted it now then i think the uh we wouldn't have known more. Uh, so there's some there's there's some small syntax things that probably we would have changed. Uh, I think at some points we went to uh, at the time when we did Scala, we just said, well, look, uh, we don't want to argue about syntax. Uh, the expression syntax and conditionals and statements, we just take it from 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 Java. We right. just don't don't want to change. And I think overall that has worked well for us. Uh, that said, I think that that had led to some uh, irregularities also in Scala. So I'll give you one. So for instance, in uh, in an if and in a while, uh, coming from Java, you have to write the imp expressions in parentheses, right? You write if parents expression. Right. Uh, but the, we also have ifs in, uh, let's say, in uh, as guards and pattern matching. So case, blah, if, and then actually there's no, no need to write the parentheses. The syntax is unambiguous that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're optional. So that's kind of, I mean, it's a small thing, but it's kind of, uh, you say, well, why should I write it? Once in, why should I follow the if once yeah. with parentheses and the other time not? So to be more regular, I think the 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 right thing would have to be to say well in in Scala you write if and then expression and then you need another token to say now you're at the end of the expression because you don't have the parentheses so you write if then and we right. didn't do that at the time because uh, we wanted to do it exactly like Java. So now I think now we're a bit more emancipated. You can say <laughs> and you, you you can say well there are certain maybe some niggly things that we could actually change. <laughs> But uh, the fact that you mentioned these kinds of details means that in general you're quite happy with how it developed. Yeah, yeah. In general, I'm happy how it developed. And I think the, the overall, uh, there's not much I would change. Uh, okay. So one thing I, I briefly want to uh, talk about before we go to the to the research um, project, um, and that is, you recently talked about or blocked about these uh, Scala levels, you know, you know, competency skill level of various people, and um, I looked at it, and it it um, well. I think it's useful to have something like that, you know, such a classification. But on the other hand, it, it shows that, I mean, you won't find that for, for Java, right? So it shows that Scala seems to be a relatively deep, I wouldn't call it a big language, but one that needs brains to work with from a certain, you know, at a, at a, at a certain level. So do you want to talk about these uh, Scala levels a bit? Yeah, so so that was essentially just to yeah to to uh, clear things up. So uh, the, the uh, you probably have also seen on the internet. There's a big debate whether Scala is a complex language or a simple language. There are yeah. a lot of people, uh, most people who have actually never tried Scala seriously. They tend to say, well, it's a very complex language. And a lot of people who have tried it say, no, no, that's not true. It's a very simple language. So what is it? So I think in the end, it's probably both. Um, so uh, if you look at simplicity, so for instance, there's this uh, wonderful Kojo environment for learning programming using Scala. 
and that shows that essentially uh, a whole number of uh, of, of a large number of kids uh, uh, can 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 program it, and not with kids at that. They are kids from Indian Indian uh, poor families that mm -hmm. go to some Indian school and they use this stuff. Uh, so that works, and I've seen a lot of kids that pick it up and say, "Well, this is easy, no problem." Uh, but then you see essentially some type signatures, and they are quite complicated. As, and, and if that's the first thing that you see, you say, "Oh my God, this is I, I will never understand this." Yeah. So, so the levels was sort of an attempt to say, "Why? Well, how can it be both?" And uh, the 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 reason it can be both is that essentially Scala is a what we call a library centric language. So. What other languages, what almost every other language would do in the language and in the compiler, we still do in the library. So, uh, for instance, the uh, complicated type signatures with implicit definitions and so on that you have in the collections, that would be the level expert library designer, seeing uh, L3, so the highest level, uh, that would in almost every other language be done in the language. You would say, no, no, that's too complicated. You can't do that in the library. I have to do that. I, me, the compiler writer, has to give it to you, and then it's pre-canned, and you can't change a thing. Sorry. Uh, but uh, that's just all you, you're going to have. Mm -hmm. So to be fair, you'd have to com combine these expert library levels with, let's say, the internal compiler or interpreter in interpretations of, let's say, Perl or Ruby or Clojure or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and then you will see that, well, that's you don't judge uh, Perl or Ruby or Clojure by the complication of the, the internal implementation. That wouldn't be fair, right? You would say, well, that's for the provider of these abstractions to worry, when I use Perl or Python or, 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 or Ruby or Clojure, then I don't want to have nothing whatsoever to do with yeah. that internal compiler stuff. In Scala, it's all out in the open because we're library-centric. The compiler only provides the, pre the, the, the base abstractions and all the rest you can do in the libraries. But that means that there's a lot of things that look complex that are out in the open. And mm -hmm. with my efforts, I try to sort of really uh, be more precise and say, what do I think is expert library writer stuff, which certainly uh, most Scala developers wouldn't need uh, in their lifetimes, maybe. And what are other stuff, st things that, which, which I think are uh, easy and profitable to use from the start. And uh, uh, because we had internally on the mailing lists a discussion about that, uh, so there was this feeling, well, uh, it can. It's really a sort sort of a a two-sided language. It can look very complicated when you write the libraries, library abstractions, and it can uh, it can be very very simple. Uh, it's usually very very simple when you use it. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to fill in the blanks and say, well, what is simple? What is complicated? So that we have something to talk about. Right. I mean, what, what, it's an interesting discussion also uh, theoretically what a simple language is. Is Lisp simple because it only has three concepts or is Java simple because it has a keyword for everything? It's, it's not clear what this means even. Indeed, there are different dimensions of simplicity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last thing. Um, I read about this dynamic type recently, or did I get something wrong, which is kind of a way of using some dynamic typing within Scala. Is that correct? Yeah, that's... Uh, uh, it's, uh, its motivation is pretty much uh, close to dynamic in C-sharp 4.0. Uh, so it's, uh, it can be used for DSLs, but I was uh, the, the, the main motivation is really to give better interop with dynamic languages. So uh, the uh, JVM has a, a number of dynamic languages that are very popular, like JRuby or Jython or Clojure. And uh, the uh, the idea was to get smoother interop with those languages. Uh, a dynamic type would be useful because then you can essentially get import some services from, let's say, JRuby and call the JRuby code without having to do a lot of reflection and a lot of casts. You just call the method and it will be this the JRuby site will take care to dispatch that to the right thing. So if a class extends or implements probably a trait um, dynamic, then uh, if you write something dot something then the dot something the second one isn't isn't statically type checked right is that, is that the idea exactly it's just translated into so the the, the dynamic trait has a method called invoke dynamic right uh, okay sort of the same as the opcode that's coming in java 7 but mm -hmm. it's a version of that and uh, when you uh, when you just do a normal method call on a thing that inherits dynamic and the method doesn't exist so static methods will take precedence over dynamic ones then uh, it will be translated into just an invoke dynamic call with the method name as a string argument that's funny um, because i 
simpler. I remember I, I, I kind of was wishing for that feature in Java a while ago. That's uh, cool to get it. <laughs> it yeah, is in Scala. Yeah, makes things really easier. That's true. That, that does need compiler support, right? Because it has to notice that in that spe spe special base class case, it shouldn't do any checking. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, it's about 10 lines of, of yeah. code in the type checker. It's not really much. Isn't that unsatisfying if you put uh, a class into the libraries, but then you have to hack the compiler to do something special with that class only? Uh, well, that's a question. That, that's an interesting question whether... Uh, so essentially, these are marker traits. They also exist in, in Java, by the way. For instance, serializable is a marker trait. No, I know. The compiler needs to know. But uh, the question is, do you want to do it that way? Or um, uh, I, I don't really have a... Some people say, well, you should use maybe an annotation instead if the compiler needs to interpret it. Uh, right. But in that case, it was uh, the... The reason was that we really want to uh, have the, the effect take place over inheritance. So you you might have dynamic and then you might have a whole subclass hierarchy that all inherits dynamic. And yeah. you want to have this dynamic dispatch thing here. Okay. So it's just one handle to do it. Um, yeah. And, and, and it, the, the class is in the standard library. So you can, in some sense, consider it part of the language. I mean, so of course, yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the research project. Um so I guess the general context is that you got some money, quite a lot of money, to do uh, research and Scala-based language extensions, and you know generally for concurrency, right? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. When when we say language extensions, what we mean by that is really embedded domain-specific languages for concurrency. Mm -hmm. So we don't plan to extend the the Scala language with concurrent constructs. Uh, Uh, so, but we want to essentially embed domain-specific languages that have these constructs. So, what's the motivation for right. that? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's clear that uh, the uh, the uh, if you extrapolate the developments in hardware, then actually it's quite frightening from the software perspective that you say the number of processor elements that you will have will double every two years at least from now on. Mm -hmm. so, Or if you extrapolate that 10 times, then uh, you say, well, that will be a factor of 1,000. So if we deal now with four or eight cores, we will deal with close to 10,000 cores in 10 years. So what do we do with those? Even if it doesn't come to pass, there are uh, already today uh, a lot of uh, very powerful processors like GPUs uh, that need a huge number of threads to be fully, fully busy. For mm -hmm. instance, the new a uh, Fermi uh, NVIDIA GPU needs 24,000 running threads to actually be fully loaded. 24,000, that's a single GPU. So mm -hmm. the question is, what do you do with that? Uh, and right now, I think we all close our eyes a little bit and say, well, uh, if we're on the server, we just uh, distribute our connections over more cores, we're okay. And if we're on the client, then, uh, well, we use this stuff only for very specific stuff like graphics, and the rest of the processors will just be idle most of the time. Yeah. And we can get away with it because, well, we haven't done this for so long, But the problem is on the on the application side, on the data side, there's also always an increasing demand for more compute power, and not just for graphics, but for big data, for um, very precise models, for for more and more refined calculations. And there will be a clash that we say, well, to to actually do these things, because individual processors are not getting a whole lot faster anymore. You will have to parallelize more and more things, and nobody knows how to do that. So that's the main problem. Mm -hmm. So if you do that, then most people say, well. Yes, but we have actors and we have STM, uh, um, software transaction memory, and all these goodies, they will help us there. And I don't believe that. I, I used to believe that. I don't believe it anymore. Uh, the reason is that even though these things are undeniably very, very useful, they're a huge step ahead from locks and, yeah. and monitors in Java. So they're all really good. But The problem is, and, and they will have a huge role in what I call concurrent programming. So concurrent programming is when you need to be parallel because the world is parallel. So you get a lot of parallel connect, uh, connections, you get interrupts from events and things like that. You hand, have to handle them concurrently. So that's hard. And we need the best tools we have. And that is currently actors and STMs are certainly great tools for that. Mm -hmm. But parallelism, 
this problem of using many cores is different because it says, well, what we used to have to run these calculations, they were sequential, right? So sequential is orders of magnitude simpler than concurrent because you don't have non-determinism, you don't have deadlocks, you don't have races, you have nothing. Yeah. So now you say, well, uh, to make use of these cores, give up your nice sequential world and uh, use all this concurrent stuff and maybe we give you some better abstractions like STM and Actors. It won't fly. People will say, well, no, the most precious resource is still programmer time and I will not make my, my application more buggy and harder to maintain uh, by going concurrent just to get these extra core powers. That won't happen, except in very, very specialized yeah. applications. So what you need to do is you need to say, well, I need to be able to run these sequential applications in parallel without ha the programmer having to worry about concurrency. And that's the difference between parallelism and concurrency. So parallelism is you write the stuff essentially in a sequential way uh, and you do not put in uh, things like actors or STM. You do not uh, specify what should be run when. That's the job of the compiler. Okay, so... As a first step in 2.9, we have these parallel collections, which are really good. They give you really good speed ups without the programmer having to do anything. They will just say, well, use this, do these operations in parallel. And mm -hmm. the rest of the compiler will, will, will figure out how to do that. Um, and that works well for, let's say, 10 cores, maybe 20 cores. Uh, I don't know how, how much further we can push that. Uh, but it won't get to 10,000 cores, 20,000 cores, simply because you don't have enough collections. Uh, yeah. You don't have enough parallelism in your program. Uh, so then the question is, well, what do you do? How do you get parallelism for 10,000 threads? And the answer is it has to come from the applications, from the domains. There are lots and lots of applications where you look at the application code, you see the parallelism. Let's say you do, uh, we, there's a project we do with Stanford on airflow simulation of a scramjet, so a hypersonic jet. Yeah. Essentially, they simulate the airflow in, in the uh, intake and in the, in the jet at a really super great detail. So it's a huge uh, computation problem. And there, of course, you see, if you follow all these, all these air molecules, you see, well, you have a lot of parallelism. Yeah. Uh, the problem is once you map that into C++ or, or any, any standard general purpose language, the parallelism is lost. All you see is a bunch of loops and things like that. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea is if you want to recover that parallelism, we have to essentially go to the domains and have a domain-specific language that lets people express this thing at a very, very high level. But, so but, they would say essentially, that's my grid, and at these points in the grid, I need a higher resolution than at these other points, and then I have this computation that I will compute over that grid. So, but and you don't want to build DSLs for air molecule simulation, right? It should be a little bit more generic, I, I think. But but then it can't be too generic because then you don't you can't express the you know you can't you don't have the right abstraction level to express the let's say domain specific parallelism. Right. So where okay. is the middle ground? Well, there is actually an, uh, a DSL for physics simulation, which is called LIST, which is embedded in Scala, which does precisely these things. So they are pretty. So there are other DSLs for, let's say, machine learning, uh, optimal for probabilistic calculation. For uh, there, there, there would be a great opportunity for, let's say, protein folding, uh, climate simulation, these sort of things. So they are essentially broad areas where, yes, you do want to want to do a DSL, but you're right, because there are many DSLs. The question is, well, you can't really write them from beginning to end uh, with a parser, with a compiler, with an optimizer, with a debugger, with an Eclipse IDE plugin. Would be way too much work. Well, but, <laughs> that, 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 that's an interesting discussion, but we shouldn't have it now. Yeah. <laughs> So the beauty is that uh, by embedding it into Scala, most of the work can be shared and reused. So essentially, there's a modular framework that a lot of the elements of these DSLs can actually be used across DSLs. Every, uh, every DSL will have some form of expression language. And yeah. uh, since they're Scala embedded, we, we typically say, well, that probably is, will be the Scala expression language. And you can share that. Uh, so the tricky bit with that, though, to, to finish off is that if you just embed them into Scala, the normal ways you embed a DSL, right, as, as essentially libraries, method calls, and things like that. Right. And again, your DSL is, uh, in the end, but when the compiler gets to see it, it's just Scala code, and the parallelism is gone. Oh, it's much harder to recover that. Yeah. So, so there's actually a twist to it, and to say, well, what these DSLs do is, when you run them, 
they will not run the code, they will not run the airflow simulation, they will do much less, they will just construct a model of themselves. Uh, essentially, the airflow program will say, well, here is, here is my structure, that's what I'm supposed to do. And then at a, at a backend step, a second uh, optimizer would come and say, okay, so that's the airflow program. Uh, I'm running on this cluster hardware. Let's optimize uh, this program on that hardware. But so, that's a backend step, which is not the, not the central Scala compiler. The Scala compiler essentially only is there to go from the DSL to its internal representation, which is uh, which is the uh, the best optimization uh, uh, representation for optimization. So let me try to to try to explain what I've understood. You put Scala code, well, you put DSL code into a Scala program. If you run it, it builds an abstract syntax tree of its own, right, basically? Uh, it's, it's more a data flow graph, yeah. Well, okay, not... well, an abstract syntax tree with all kinds of more or less semantic annotations. Right, 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 exactly. Okay. Yeah. Then, then what, hap what happens first? This is obviously translated to, well, first the Scala compiler translates this so you can actually run it. So then when you run the program and this tree or graph is built, then you need something that transforms and optimizes this graph exactly and then outputs what that it depends outputs, that depends where you run it it, right. output, it, it can output CUDA it can output uh, MPI on clusters so, it can output plain, plain JVM code, so, code so here is what I don't understand or what I maybe I do understand and I want to ask about it um, so it's possible that this running Scala program creates let's say C code Of course, yeah, that's possible. That's so you, actually there's a prototype that exists that does that, yeah. So you don't so you don't really so you do embed the the DSL code into Scala, but it doesn't necessarily run as part of a Scala program because you can't easily quote dynamically load a C function into a running Scala program. That's also right, yeah. Yeah, so that that it poses some limitations to it. So usually what you do is uh that you uh, in the back end you have a splitter which says okay this i can run on 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 normal byte codes and this other other stuff is essentially CUDA or OpenCL and that will run on the GPU and the compiler will take care of to 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 move the data back and forth so, so then, we haven't got, gotten this integrated thing yet. I mean, we have five years to work on it, but that's the idea that we do that. Right now, we have sort of individual bits and pieces where we say, well, yes, we can map to C, we can map to CUDA, but, uh, but we have to integrate it all into a, into a common thing where, where then really the, the core would be, uh, would be standard Scala execution on, let's say, JVM, and the other thing would be just sent to special purpose processes. Right, because, I mean, the, the, from my perspective, there are two aspects to embedded DSLs. One is the syntactical embedding. So you can, as you said, reuse parts of the Scala expression language, for example, in your own DSL. That's right, yeah. But then there is the embedding of the running program. Like if you think about uh, Rails, then the embedded Rails DSL program runs as part of the execution of the Ruby program in which it is embedded. And that is not necessarily true in your case, right? No, that's not necessarily true. That's right. That it could could run elsewhere. Okay, that that's interesting. Um, okay. Well, I I <laughs> I could probably discuss about this for an hour or so, but but yes. we shouldn't do this now. <laughs> I'll send you an email. Um, okay, so um, there is this term polymorphic embedding that's used as the let's say pattern for building these DSLs. Do you want to say three words about that? Yeah. So. So the the point is, uh, it, it comes down to the splitting. So you have an embedded DSL, so that means essentially you start off with a Scala program. Some parts of it are this DSL, let's say, for airflow simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, other parts might not be. I mean, there might even be several DSLs. There might be a visualization DSL, an airflow simulation DSL, and essentially a Scala program that ties these two together. So the question is, which is which? How do we know whether an expression is just a plain old Scala expression or whether it should essentially reflect itself and construct a tree. Mm -hmm. And the way we know is with the types. Uh, so essentially the way we do that is that we have in a DSL, we would have, uh, let's say, the, the, the airflow type uh, simulation. We would have, uh, we would distinguish that. We would have the same syntactic form of expression, but it gives you a different type. 
uh, namely uh, essentially uh, 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 DSL type. DSL, so you would have plain Scala int and DSL int, you would have uh, Scala floats, DSL floats, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what is a DSL int then? I mean, at runtime, when you run it, well, it's, it's uh, not uh, a 32 bit number. It is an expression, so at an AST or uh, in our case a data flow graph or whatever you choose, that when you run it will return an int. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so and that's essentially the polymorphic embedding that we say. Well, well, you can have the same form of expressions, and depending on what type you are, and the types get determined. Essentially, you can just inherit traits, and they will fill in the types. Uh, they could mean this thing or this other thing. Okay. What's nice about it is that it lets you easily debug the whole thing. So you could say, well, never mind performance right now. I just want to run this as a Scala program. Right. So I can just say, well, DSL int equals Scala int, and the whole thing will be run just as a normal Scala program. And afterwards, when I say, well, I need the performance, I can actually play games with that and say, well, now I want to reinterpret the DSL int type and say DSL int is really my data flow graph that when run will would return an int, and then I pass this whole thing to my backend processor that will spit out optimized parallel code. Okay, but that's that's why we say it's polymorphic. That means it could be many things. Uh, you don't you don't burn it in from the start. What kind of interpretation your expression will have? It could be DSL thing, or, or it could be standard Scala thing. And then these different. DSL things build different ASTs or data flow graphs, and then they are translated differently. Uh, yeah, they would be translated differently. Uh, even though typically uh, the the uh, the data flow graphs would uh, would all be uh, built on a common framework to right. be able to reuse common optimizations. Okay, so just to to make sure we we me and the listeners really understand the DSLs you're going to build are not general purpose concurrency expression DSLs like actors or message passing or something like that. These are really specific DSLs for specific purposes and what you're going to do is you kind of build a couple of examples to prove the approach, not build a bunch of re you know DSLs that everybody can use. That's right, yeah. Okay. But, but the point is, if you really want to use these 10,000 cores or whatever, then uh, we won't get there with uh, with uh, with uh, standard no, uh, I, general abstractions. I, so so the only way to get there is to essentially pick domain after domain after domain and say, well, I have a way now to make machine learning code fast. Yes. I have a way now to get make probabilistic computation code fast. I mean, so so it's not a silver bullet. It's essentially a way to to gradually get more and more applications to a state where they can actually use these 10,000 cores. Right. And for me, that's currently the best we can do. I don't know any other way how to how we could, I, could use that otherwise. I completely, I mean, I absolutely agree. I mean, that it's not just true for concurrency, actually. To be, to all just, you know, things like productivity, just becoming more expressive requires domain orientation. And that's what I've been, in some sense, working on for, for years with this whole DSL topic. And, and so I obviously, I think concurrency is one of these areas where, or um, let's say differently, if you do air molecule simulation or, or calculations, it's not just the ability to generate highly performant code that is domain specific. Also, the notations might be matrices and other, you know, uh, domain specific, mathematics specific things. So, using DSLs to express these concisely and then using a domain specific backend to generate efficient code is is clearly the way to go. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, in a way, it's to it's a way to reuse the expertise of uh, of uh, because I mean there will, there will sp still be a lot of expertise required so somebody has to write these DSLs and the, the people who write the DSLs have to have the domain knowledge that they know exactly what's required on the simulation side yep. and they have to have the concurrency knowledge they have to know how to how to map these things efficiently uh, but the, the the point is you afterwards after this is done you can reuse it then the actually physicists or people using that they don't need to know about clusters and mpi and all right. this stuff anymore they can use the dsl so yeah. that's a, sort of the promise that you do things once and then can reuse the the pr very precious expertise of the people who know how to parallelize as well right and since you were talking about silver bullets um the silver bullet if there is one would not be you know, the fact that you now have this general purpose DSL, which is a kind of oxymoron in itself anyway. Um, but the, the silver bullet would be the framework and the infrastructure you're researching to be able to quickly and easily, relatively quickly and easily, build these kinds of DSLs. 
Yeah, but uh, like I said, I don't think there is a silver bullet. No, I no, think. but that's the that's the advance you make to make building yeah. DSLs more simple, so it becomes practical for many domains. Yeah, yeah, I think I think now we have a we have a lever to to be able to push things. So I, the way I see it, uh, previously we we had just no idea how to use ten thousand cores in a in a in a way that uh, that was reusable, and now we have. Uh, um, an idea how this might work with continuous work. It's not a silver bullet at right. all. It just means that uh, we have a way to canalize and organize the, uh, the the work of that's still necessary of a lot of experts in domains and in parallelism. Yeah. Last question. Do you expect um, that it requires actual Scala language extensions to make this work? Or do you think this can all be done with the existing facilities and put into libraries and, and fancy types? Uh, it it will require not so much extensions, but some slight reinterpretation. So there there is a there's, there's some small tweaks we have to do to the language standard, which are done. We have a branch uh, essentially for this work that does them in an experimental way. They haven't been rolled back into trunk yet. Uh, so what it re requires is is actually very simple. So uh, Scala already lets you reinterpret plus or times or op any operations, any method call, any way you like, because, uh, well, it's just a method call, and on your new types, you can reinterpret these methods any way you like, right? Yeah. Uh, but there, there are a couple of things that are not in that category. So one of them is if-then-else. Uh, mm. If-then-else is hard-coded in the language. It takes a Boolean, and it gives you either that expression or that expression as a return. And in DSLs, let's say I, I want to do a DSL that... Uh, uh, does continuous evaluation of a signal. So then I want to say, well, my, that it would make perfect sense to have an if-then-else, which says, well, for the periods where essentially my conditional signal is true, I will evaluate my resulting signal to the then part, and mm -hmm. otherwise I will evaluate it to the end part. So then the if-then-else wouldn't take a Boolean, but a signal of Boolean as its condition. Right now, right. I can't do that because the if then else is, is, is a hard, it's a language construct. So what we do in the virtual, what we call language virtualization and in the virtualization branch, what we do is essentially we take if then else and the, the other couple of remaining constructs. So it's while do and for loop. No, for loops are already virtualized, but while loops and tries and things like that. And we map them also to method calls that you can override. Okay. So essentially all we need to do is free these few remaining language things which are hard-coded in the language to say, well, they are. there's also a way to reinterpret those. And right. once you have that, you have full language virtualization and you can do that. That's, I think, all that's needed. Can I ask you one more last question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, now, once you have this nice high-level DSL for airflow molecule, whatever, um, and then, then, of course, you do have a, a custom backend and you have a custom notation, uh, custom in the sense, you know, whatever you can do with Scala's flexible syntax. What about IDEs? I mean, do you think about being able to use some, let's say, meta programming in the furthest sense to, to adapt the IDE so you get domain specific code completion, domain specific error messages beyond what you can do through magic typing? Because these, these type errors will not be domain specific, they will say something about types and nobody gets what it means. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, generally for DSLs, uh, it's a general problem with embedded DSLs that you say, well, right. uh, in the embedding you get all the errors in the in the host language and not the embedded language. Um, and and that, that, that can be a problem because then if you ship this, uh, this fancy new embedded language, let's say to a physicist, and to say, well, you use that, but if you use other things, it really would help if you knew Scala as well, because that's in the, in the end what you program. And then, well, maybe not every physicist will jump at that and say, yeah, Scala was the thing I wanted to learn anyway for, for all this time. <laughs> yes. So, so, so what do we do there? So, so I think one possibility which we want to explore is to have uh, something like, like profiles. So that we, one idea would be that we could, at the head of the program, say essentially what language are we talking about, and then we could use our plugin architecture of the compiler to say after the parser, after the parser is done, we essentially would check whether the program that's written here actually conforms to the DSL that was declared. Right. So say I want list, uh, then the, the 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 checker would actually check that on, you you use only list constructs, and you could push that so far that this checker that would run before the 
general uh, Scala type checker would be so uh, refined that it would catch all type errors as well. Once you do that, then you you know that afterwards, essentially, once you get to the real Scala type checker, uh, all this stuff is just for translation. There wouldn't be any errors anymore. Right. Uh, so that would be nice, and I think it's doable. It depends how difficult the typing problems in DSLs are, but typically they're much, much simpler yes. as typing problems in the base language. Uh, then the next question is, how do you do push that into completion and other, the, other IDE features? And that's indeed a very good question, and that's also some of the questions we want to look at in the research program. Okay. So I, I, I see it's, it's a it, we have a problem there that we want to solve, and it's, it should be very interesting to think of solutions to that. Because in the end, that's the big advantage of real external DSLs, right? If you use XTEX or MPS or Intentional or whatever, you get a complete IDE for it. And that is appealing. But somebody has to write that, yeah. I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. That was very interesting as an update and an outlook of what's going to happen. Thank you, Marcos. It was fun talking again. Good. Very good. And, uh, well, have a nice, what is it, Monday? Have a nice week. <laughs> have a nice week to you Thanks. too. Bye. So that's it. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. And of course, once again, thanks to Martin for being on the show. I think this is a very interesting project. And it's also, I really like to hear what he says, right? I mean, this, this statement that you can only become significantly more efficient if you become domain specific is, is clearly aligned with my line of thinking. So great to see that and and it's going to be interesting i mean i've worked a lot with dsls with various tools and you probably when you listen to it you, you heard me almost say the word mps right <laughs> but um it will be interesting to see how far they can actually take it and use a text only language you know and and and, and the question will be mostly from my perspective this ability to customize the ide anyway i'm certainly going to follow it fascinating topic and um I hope you found it interesting as well. Let us know what you think. You can reach us at team at se-radio.net. And, uh, well, uh, that's it. Bye. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. SE Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick Reddit Delicious and Slashdot buttons or by talking about us on Twitter and Facebook. You can also support us by joining the team and shouldering some of the work. To contact the team, please send an email to team at se-radio.net or if your feedback is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, are licensed under a Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details.